So good evening. Good evening. We can turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4. Thank you, James, for that song. And uh, I thanked Bob Bergstresser privately, but publicly I want to thank him for the song he did on the saxophone this morning. It's just, it's neat to hear how the people of our church are ministering to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and how we can sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. Amen? So. That goes right along with uh, our theme this evening is uh, generational wisdom. And so you have, we do sing the songs that have been passed down to us from generation to generation, and yet we still have people who are building on the theologies of Christ, theologies of the Bible, in writing new hymns and whatnot, and we're learning those songs as well. So it's, it's really good to hear some of the new stuff that comes out and that's rich in theology and teaching us um, and, and just having us worship God um, for the mercy, the grace that he gives us, the eternal life that we have in him. Uh, from the beginning of time, if you will, it's been the parents' responsibility to teach their children what God uh, requires of us. And I'm sure Adam and Eve had a job to do. Um, Adam was... Uh, the, the one in charge there, and yes, he did uh, fall and bring sin into this world, but yet he still had the responsibility of leading his family in true worship of God. Uh, when I think of a command, if you will, for, for uh, parents who teach their children, uh, the first thing I think of is Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. So if you turn there really quick, we can read through this. I know I just told you to turn to Proverbs 4. But, but I know I will stumble over the words if I try to recite it right now. So Deuteronomy 6. And I'm actually going to read uh, the first couple of verses before we get to Shema. If I'm pronouncing that right. S-H-E-M-A. S-H-E-M-A. I think that's how it is. But he says in, in verse 1 there, God says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to, pos uh, to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I have commanded you, you and your sons and your grandsons, all the days of your life, that your days may be uh, may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. And so I think we can, uh, let's say verses 4 and 5 together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command to you today shall be in your heart. Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall walk a uh, talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So parents commanded to teach the commands of of God. And this is what we've been studying in Proverbs up to this point so far, haven't we? With Solomon sitting down saying, my son, hear my words. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 it starts right, right at the beginning. He says, um, my son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. Uh, some translations translate the teachings of your mother. So it's the father and the mother are commanded to teach, to pass down wisdom, pass down understanding and knowledge to their children, um, especially uh, the knowledge of God, who he is, his laws, his statutes, his principles. Uh, that's, that is what is required of us. Uh, so from the beginning of time, it's been man's responsibility, if they are in right relationship with God, to teach that to their children, and even to their grandchildren. And we have several examples of 
parents who did that in the Bible and parents who did not do that in the Bible. Uh, my first thoughts are, you know, you think of Eli and, and Samuel, both of them. Um, their sons were wicked men. They did not, you know, well, obviously the, the Bible didn't tell us everything they taught as the kids were growing up, but uh, they did not heed the voice of their father. You know, at the very least, it was, you know, we know it was on the, the son's fault for um, disobeying. The father is not to be judged for the son, sins of the son. Um, I remember um, a message my dad was teaching way back when, when he was talking about the, the man that pleaded with Christ to save his son, his son's life, because there was nothing that could be done. And the only thing he could do is beg Christ to save his son's life. And that's what we as parents, really, we can teach, but we cannot save our children's soul, can we not? And this was the application. There's nothing we can do to change the heart of our children. We can have our household rules. We can sit down and teach them to fear God, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We can uh, tell them all this, but when it comes time for them to make their own decisions, their decisions are their decisions. There's nothing we can do to change a heart, but that does not take us away from the responsibility of teaching our children truth. And so we don't know exactly where Samuel and Eli went wrong, if they went wrong, but we know their children did not heed the voice of God uh, taught by their fathers um, if indeed they were taught. So we, don't, you know, we assume that it was um, possibly a failure for teaching uh, their son's truth. Uh, but we also think of uh, good examples of parents who did. I think of Timothy. Uh, when, when Paul says, um, the faith that was in your mother Eunice and your grandmother Lois. And that's the faith that Paul sees in Timothy. It was two generations there that Timothy uh, received the truths of God and the faithfulness of godly living. And so we have uh, a generational ministry there. Uh, I think of Ruth. Uh, her mother-in-law taught her the things of God. Ruth was a Moabitess. And um, she decided, no, your God is going to be my God. Where you go, I go. She wanted to be with her mother-in-law. And so you have the, the parent, in this, in this case an in-law, teaching her daughter-in-law who the true God is and who uh, true worship is. So here we have Solomon teaching his son and telling him the words of his father David. So I'm going to read through uh, verses 1 through 9 of Proverbs chapter 4, then we'll uh, stop, pause a minute, and, and ask God to bless the teaching of his word. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender, and, only, and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, Let your heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you that we have your wisdom given to us in the form of the scriptures. Thank you for the, the men that have gone before us, the women, the, the, the uh, Christians who have paved the way as we, as we have sung, just sung Faith of Our Fathers. Uh, we have those shoulders to stand on. And uh, we just uh, thank you for the generations that we have to look back on and to, to uh, see the truths of Scripture lived out before us so that we can emulate those uh, to the generations that come after us. Help us, Lord, to continue to be wise with uh, our teachings of the scriptures and not to promote our own selves. Help us to be humble and help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and teach our children to do the same. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So first of all, we have here the Father's words of instructions. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father. And so there's two commands that he gives. Uh, one is hear, right? And we did talk about that a little bit, what it means to hear. Uh, when I think of that word hear, as it relates to scriptures and the command, you know, I think of in Revelation when the, the, the angel says to the different churches, the angels say to the different churches, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. And so we're talking about understanding, uh, putting, it, you know, not putting into practice, knowing not just that, okay, I hear words coming out over here. Um, I think of my great-grandfather, uh, um, Joe Saul II. One, he was getting deaf by the time I got to know him more. And you had to shout to talk to him. And uh, the phrase you'd often say is, I can hear you talking, but I can't understand what you're saying. You know, so we had to shout louder or speak slower or whatever. And he had his hearing aid that would, would help him in. We could communicate eventually. Um, but to hear, it's not just hearing the, the vibrations of sound through the air hitting you. And, you know, sometimes we hear things. And, and we ignore a lot of times I do that with my kids. I'm so busy into something and they're like, dad, 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 what? You know, <laughs> I'm sure most of your parents have that same um, uh, experience with your kids sometimes or, or, or vice versa. You know, you call your kids and they don't come down, you know, because they're doing something. And so the words, the, my, the sounds may be there, uh, but they don't necessarily hear, even though they hear the sounds, they're not perceiving, if you will. And so I think of, uh, I think of that when, when we're thinking of the word hear. Um, it also makes me think of the condemnation on Israel when Jesus says they have ears but do not hear. Um, or God says it to, to Isaiah, I believe. He says they'll have ears but not hear uh, what, what you have to say. And so this is a plea. It's not just a command. It's a plea. You know, wanting and having a desire for his son to hear what he has to say. Um, hence, the next command is to give attention to no understanding. So you have, you have that plea in the form of a command. Hear what I have to say. Give attention to no understanding. So with knowledge comes understanding. You know, I could have... Uh, Robbie, he's down in the sound room. You know, he does software, um, uh, co writes code for software for his job. You know, I could have him come and tell me what he does for a living. And I could hear what he's saying. <laughs> I doubt that I'd understand what he's saying. Does anyone here know software, no code? Okay, got Mr. Caselli, he's one person, so... I know my brother knows it really well, my brother John. So I'm sure Robbie and John, if they come up here and have a conversation about the work they do, they would know exactly what each other are saying, and all of us would be like, it's all Greek to me, you know. Not, not understand your hearing, but you're not understanding. Yet at the same time, that's what Robbie went to school for. That's what my brother went to school for, was to learn code, to learn how to engineer software. So that when their, their boss says, I have this task that needs to be done, can you write me software to do it? And, and, and they can give some instructions and parameters and whatnot, and, and hopefully, it's what they're paid for, they can pump out a piece of software that can do the job that they need to be done. Whereas if that guy came to me and said, I need this, I'd be like, sorry, I, I, I don't understand. I don't know. And we can, we can plug in a lot of scenarios. Um, people who know music theory a lot better than I do. Um, people who know mathematics a lot more. Um, I just thought of this. I had it lined up. Does anyone know where this comes from? The sum of the square root of any two sides of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. Oh, joy, I've got a brain. Does that ring a bell to anybody? <laughs> Where's that quote from? The Wizard of Oz. It was what the scarecrow said when, when the wizard gave him his diploma. He's like, oh, joy, I've got a brain. Well, I just remember my dad saying that was actually quoted wrong or something. 
It's not correct. That's something he understood. It was all mumbo jumbo to me. I didn't understand it. It was like, oh, sure, that sounds good, right? He knew it was false because he knows mathematics, right? He has understanding. I didn't. Why? Because he studied mathematics and he teaches mathematics. That's his job. And so um, he can point out what is true and what is false. You know, I'm sure if you started telling about the theory of relativity and Einstein, it might, <laughs> nope, that's beyond me now. You know, uh, but he teaches trigonometry and calculus at the Pilgrim Academy. He understands uh, how the workings of that, uh, of that go. And so Solomon here is saying, give attention to understanding. Why does he know more mathematics than a lot of people? Because he gave attention to understanding it. Why does Robbie know code more than all of us here? Because he gave attention to understanding it. Same with Mr. Holland and the music theory. He gave attention to understanding it. And so when we have the word of God before us, and the beautiful thing about the word of God, it is so simplistically complicated, right? A child can understand truths from it. The child can understand that he or she is a sinner and needs a savior. How many of you got saved as a child? Amen. And so you understand very basic things uh, truths that Christ laid out. You understand that Adam and Eve sinned. You understand that sin is deserving of death and that you want to be, you don't know much about hell. You don't know much about uh, the sins of this world. You don't know, understand the total depravity of man yet. These are things that you build on as you give attention to understanding God's word and God's law. And so um, we're, we're, we're tasked with teaching our children, and here he's pleading with them in this command, give attention to understanding, um, because with, with knowledge comes understanding. And then he says, um, after he gives these two commands, these two pleas, he says, for I give you good doctrine, do not forsake my law. And so, you know, just like my dad when he's teaching in calculus or trigonometry or algebra or geometry, I give you good theorems that you can do to understand how geometry works. Um, you know, he's saying here, I give you good doctrine. This is from the Word of God. This is not only from the Word of God, it's also been taught to me by my father. And that's what he says in in um, verse 4, he, my father, uh, when I was my father's son, tender and only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said, let your heart retain my words. So he's starting now to teach what he has been taught. And isn't that what God says uh, uh, that the church should be? Let, uh, let's teach others so that they may teach others also. Right? That is our job. When we make disciples, we are teaching them about God's word, his law, how we as Christians should live, you know, be, like, be kind to one another, forgive one another, love one another. This is what has been taught to us. We need to be teaching that to others also so that they can teach the next generation coming, coming after them. And so he can say this with confidence, that this is good doctrine. Why? Because it's in the word of God that the prophets have given us. And I've seen it come to play in my fa own father's life. And Solomon surely knew the sins of his father. You know, he knew the, the consequences that happened, why there's strife. The sword shall not depart in your house was the, was the uh, punishment that David received. So there was the brothers of his half-brothers there fighting over who's going to be the next king of Israel and, and whatnot, and yet he knows God was the one that chose him. The, the um, Davidic covenant went through Solomon here. So he's seen the work of God. He's seen his father David's psalms, all the psalms that he wrote in praise to God, in, in prayer to God, seeking refuge and strength. And so he knows this, coupled with the fact that we know from Scripture he is the most wisest person um, in the world. Uh, why? Because God gave that to him. He asked 
for understanding to judge so great people. Now, if I can go off on a little bit of a rabbit trail here. We talk about Solomon giving these instructions. And I was doing a little bit of research trying to figure out about when. Solomon was about 20 years old when he became king. He's probably about 40s, in his lower 40s, uh, in this time when he's teaching possibly Rehoboam. And we know that Rehoboam uh, did not heed the voice of his father. And, and um, uh, what did it say about the law of your mother? Keep the law of your mother. He went astray. He took all his father's um, advisors and, and said, I don't want to listen to you. I'm going to listen to the advisors that are of my own age. And, and what happened was the kingdom was torn in two. And half went, and the, the whole northern half, Ju Judah, and half the tribe of Benjamin stayed under Rehoboam's rule. Um, and then and, and, uh, there was sin that was caused by that. Um, so somewhere he left the teachings of his father. Um, so this, this rabbit trail I have, we have this wisest man who have ever lived. And we read through the book of Ecclesiastes, all the worldly things that he tried to find happiness, to, to high, find value. And what was his conclusion? All is vanity and vexation of spirit. There's nothing on this world that satisfies. I know because I tried it all. With all my wealth, with all my liberties, with all my power, he was able to do a scientific experiment on himself with the sins of the world. And you're thinking, how in the world can this wise man who's been given great wisdom from God. And, and, you know, this wisdom has been broadcasted out. You had people coming from far just to see Solomon and hear his wise sayings. Yet, as the Bible says, he let his wives turn his heart away. He made high places for his many wives to go worship their gods. You know, we can look at this and... Judge Solomon, oh, I would never do that. You know, we don't know what we do. We, we're capable of any, any sin. Um, that's what total depravity is. By God's grace, we'd make right decisions. Um, but how can Solomon, who is the wisest man, fall in such a bad way? Um, there's an article uh, written by Bruce Watke. I don't know where he's from. Don't know much about him, but I was reading an article and he was the author and he said, if one should ask, if Solomon is the wise author, how could he have died such a fool? Let it be noted that he constructed his own gibbet on which he impaled himself. That is, he ceased to listen to his own instructions. Spiritual success today does not guarantee spiritual success tomorrow. And, and so even though Solomon could, in confidence, say, this is good doctrine, he turned away himself from the doctrine. The plea he had for his son was, don't turn away. But then he himself turned away. And... Um, comes back to God, and we see that in the Ecclesiastes, that he just realizes this was all utter foolishness. It was vanity and vexation of spirit. But that does not mean that we, right now, are safe from the effects sin could potentially still drag us aside. There's a reason why the Apostle Paul said, lay aside every sin and the, and the weight that so easily besets us. You know, it's easy for us to be caught away in our own sin. And so we should not look at Solomon and say, I would never do that, because we probably do <laughs> uh, turn away from our own instructions that we give our children. And this is why it's important that we, that we show our children that we read our Bibles and pray every day. We can stumble and fall into sin just as much as the next guy. And it doesn't matter how long you've been in the word. 
we're still fighting our sin nature on a daily basis. Take up your cross daily and follow me. It doesn't say take up your cross daily and follow me until you've achieved whatever. You know, we won't achieve perfection until Christ comes and makes us perfect. So even though we are imperfect people, we can still teach the next generation and say, this is truth. I can know it's true because of what God has done for me, what God has done for others. And hopefully, if I were to fall away, you know, that what I've taught sticks with the person. So in other words, don't say, you know, because there's a lot of pastors falling by the wayside. I, uh, I think, I mean, I can think of four pastors right off the top of my head right now who have left their church, left their ministries because they went with another woman. They left their wife and committed adultery. Um, so does that mean that all the things they've taught about God is wrong? No. So don't, you know, we, we need to still be in the word. So if a leader in the church falls by the wayside, falls prey to his sin, we say, you know what? That sin, that's not what God designed. And we are strong ourselves in the word and, and keep on being faithful and teaching that word no matter what bad things might happen to leaders. So yet Solomon, king of Israel, the wisest man, fell. Yet the words that he taught his son still ring true, even though he fell into sin. Um, and of course, through the Sunday morning messages, we learned, we're learning relearning, being reminded, if you will, of the mercy and the grace of God to bring anyone back. So Solomon is proof that forsaking wisdom is destruction and even deadly. And so the grandfather, we come to the second here, the grandfather's words of instruction. Um, he says his father basically issued the same pleas. He's saying, retain um, uh, retain my words, keep my commands and live, get wisdom, get understanding, don't forsake nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will preserve you. And so we saw in Proverbs chapter one, we saw a little bit in Proverbs chapter three and we'll see later in Proverbs chapter eight and nine that wisdom is personified as a woman crying out, come, be Love me, embrace me. I will do these many things for you. And, and here's a list right here. So Solomon, in telling um, his son of this person called wisdom, he say, I learned this from my father. He says, do not forsake her. She will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace and a crown of glory she will deliver to you. So we need to cherish wisdom and seek after wisdom, desire wisdom, uh, just be around wisdom as much as we possibly can. And where is wisdom found? In, in the word of God. You know, Job gives this whole discourse on wisdom that, I, that we read a number of weeks back. Man turns up the earth, looks everywhere for it, and it can't be found, and it is more precious than gold and rubies and precious stones. And so we, we seek after this wisdom. And by God's grace, wisdom is found in the previous generation. As they've learned, as they've, as they've trusted God, as they've seen God work, they can pass that wisdom down to the next generation. And so that's what we are called to do, is to crave after wisdom, seek her for ourselves, and then pass that along so that others may have wisdom. Um, I have a couple of discussion questions that I wanted to bring up, but I'm not going to get to both of them. One of the things, I'll just... I do, want to, I do want to communicate it to you, so I'll, I'll just kind of leave it as food for thought. How's that? Um, there has been lots of studies that religious people are happier than irreligious people. Have anyone seen those studies? 
A lot comes out. You can Google that and just all kinds of study after study after study. People who practice religion are happier. There's a columnist from Life Science. He states that this study is true, but he lays out the reasons why he feels that it is nothing to do with God because obviously God does not exist. That was me adding he didn't say that. He just said it doesn't have anything to do with God. The study, in the study, he claims that the reason for religion, the reason is that because religion is a social structure. People are happier because it gives them meaning. It gives them a purpose. They are part of a group or a family. They have a supportive system to fall back on in times of need. Is that true? Is our religion a supportive structure? Is it does it give us joy to be with the people of like faith? Is that the reason for our happiness, though? And that's where I believe this falls short. Um, it's, it, you know, it's almost as if God knew what he was doing when he put the church together. Right? Why he tells us, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But the difference in my mind is where do you put your trust? Are you putting your trust in this social structure? Or are you putting your trust in God alone? And that's one of the things that James talked about this morning was Israel. Don't put your trust in anything else, only in God. And so the reason we here can be happier than even other religions is because we know where true happiness comes from. It's from God himself. And our trust is in him and him alone. Um, and so many people will turn to different religions because it works. It is a system that works to bring about some sort of happiness. Unfortunately, we know from the word of God, it's not going to be a lasting happiness. But I, I remember a, a video by Vodou Bakum, why I choose to believe the Bible. He says, one of the worst um, reasons you can give is because I tried it and it works for me. You know? Well, and he, then he goes on to tell a story of Malcolm X, who was in all kinds of trouble, in jail, whatever, and then he came to the religion of Islam. And it brought him out of, it gave him purpose, it gave him a, 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 a lot of um, the happiness with the people around him and, and whatnot. And so it worked for him to bring him out of his slump, if you will. Uh, but... In the end, he, he ended up dying miserable. You know, that it didn't work forever. You know, why? You're trusting in a religious system. You're not trusting in God himself. So, so yes, uh, and, and it's, it's cool. He gives the whole reason why he chooses to believe the Bible. And then at the end, he says, oh, and by the way, it works for me. You know, <laughs> so it was like an addendum rather than the main reason. Um, so when you see all these things that wisdom can do for you, exalt you and promote you and honor you and embrace you and place a crown uh, of, of glory on you, these are things wisdom does for you when you um, embrace her as, as your own. It gives you true happiness. We sang a couple weeks ago, happiness is to know the Savior. And then the last thing I wanted to bring up with this uh, generational wisdom idea, this is the whole reason why I encourage my kids to come to church. This is the whole reason why I bring my boys with me to the men's prayer breakfasts and encourage them to do Men's Day in the Word. So they have multi-generations of people. This is why I like the Sunday morning summer schedule. I know some, some people miss the after church fellowship, but we'll get back to that. But it is nice seeing generations in a room talking the Word of God to one another, speaking the word of God to one another. And so um, they can see firsthand people who have been saved their entire lives for 50, 60, 70 years. They see the older generation who may have gotten saved only two, three, four, five years ago. Now, how God brought them out of this world and plugged them into the family of God. Yet there's still wisdom there. The, the person that's been saved for 60 some odd years, the person that's 60 years old and saved for five years. There's wisdom when that, especially the person that's been saved, he knows exactly what he's been saved from. Those of us who've been saved at five, six, seven years old, 
we have to come to realize later in life, <laughs> you know, some of the hardships we've been saved from. We haven't had to go through the, the drug addictions. We haven't had to go through the jail time or the, or the juvenile, you know, system, the juvenile detention system and whatnot. We've been saved from a lot of the heartaches of this world. Um, but those that did have to go through that or losing their house because of poor choices they've made, we can learn wisdom from them as well. And so uh, having this support group within the church that teaches children along with the adults and the adults can plug their lives into the lives of the children and teach truth. It's not just me, dad, teaching my kids, but my kids, the Bible says there's a safety in a multitude of counselors. So I encourage my kids to go to youth group. You know, I'm so glad Jack, and not, I, I, I love what Shane did too. So I'm not, <laughs> but it's, it's part of the team now. You've, you've, you've helped energize that team. The Wiggins have done an awesome job there in the youth group and I have nothing but praise for that family and all the things that they do. Um, but they're dumping their lives into the next generation and showing them what does it mean to live like Christ. Hey, we can have fun as a group without doing all the worldly things. But here's what Christ says. And I just want us to remember, though, that the world's wisdom is against the wisdom of God. You know, the Bible says it is foolishness. God's wisdom is foolishness to man. And so this is what we're up against. And this is why it's, it's important that our children come to church and be with the people of God regularly, not just once in a while. You know, just developing those relationships with that older generation as we, the older generation, teach by example how to live out uh, the Christian lives. So I was going to have you share some words of wisdom you've gotten from previous generations, but we, we don't have time. So maybe you can share with each other in our fellowship time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this church, and it has stood since 1903. Um, Lord, that's a very long time in our years. Uh, we know in the grand scheme of things, that's just still a, a little vapor, Lord. But you've uh, let this church endure through a lot and the, the generations passing the word of God down and, and, and this church still stands firmly on your word. And we pray that we may stand firmly on your word for generations to come until you come, until Christ comes and takes us home. Thank you, Lord, and I pray that we may be faithful in loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.